Greetings and welcome. My name is Ambassador Professor David K. Ewan. I'm the Ambassador Professor representing the United States to the nations in the area of civilian business, education, and technology. We've been in operation uh, as an ambassadorship for five years, in business for 26 years, and we primarily have been working in the past broadcasting out to Asia, the Middle East, Europe, uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, um, and more recently Latin America. But for season two of Inspire, we are welcoming the United States as part of our viewing audience. So America, we welcome you. Um, I'm originally from Boston and continue to live with my wife in Massachusetts. So we are in the northeast corner of the United States. And today's topic will be what's the deal? What's the story with God? Now, the reason why I'm sharing this on a program such as this is this is a question that I am asked often. Who is God and what is God? Those are two different questions and they have different types of answers. But the reason why I'm asked those two different type of questions is because the concept of God is very diverse around the world. There's monotheism, the belief in the God, one God, and then there's polytheism, the belief in multiple gods. And then there's uh, what is commonly referred to as idolatry, the, the belief in praying into certain idols, for example, a statue. There's so much more than that. So from the standpoint that I present um, from myself as an ambassador or an ambassador professor to the nations, I will explain to you God as the way I understand, the way I believe it, because that is the question that I am often asked. So I will publicly in a global setting announce to you my understanding of who God is. Okay, so what arguments can be said as to God's existence and the purpose of prayer that goes along with that? Because with God, there's, there's a prayer, that's the communication, and then there's the worship, and the worship is the reverence, and it is also part of uh, the communication. There's other assets or aspects uh, related to the belief of God and the communication with God uh, that involves a, a fasting perhaps. Um, and I say perhaps because some people have belief in that, others don't. Um, and then there's um, other types of worship. Some of it involves action, some of it involves song. Um, so we're going to give a more of a global understanding who God is. And I'm on the slant of the monotheism um, I steer away from the idolatry. I steer away from the polytheism because that is not part of my belief. So I am in the venue of Christianity. So that's what we'll be talking about. So um, there are six arguments from uh, different points of view that validate the purpose of prayer. So I dare say to you to pray. Um, and that's going to be the primary concept of our message. Um, there are six arguments that validate prayer, and prayer is the communication to God. Um, there are six arguments, and I'll tell you what they are. There's the biblical argument, okay, it's written in the Bible. There's the historical argument, we can read a lot in history. There's the empirical argument, that's what we think about. There's the logical argument, and that satisfies those who are more analytical. There's the scientific argument, as there is the argument in terms of the belief of God, is there a scientific proof? So we'll talk about that. And there's the purpose argument. So I'm going to say that again. Again, there are six, there are six arguments that validate prayer. And when we talk about prayer, the reason why we pray is because we believe in God. Okay, so there's the biblical argument, the historical argument, the empirical argument, the logical argument, and the uh, scientific argument, and the purpose argument argument. So let me first go to the biblical argument. And because I'm talking about the biblical argument, I'm going to bring up a scripture which is from the Holy Bible, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 
16 again that's second timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and all scripture is god breathed uh and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so in the biblical argument we're talking about god as an entity of correction to bring us to a point that we're called to be by god okay this refers to us having a purpose but a purpose of not our choosing a purpose of god's choosing so now that we have that understanding i'm going to read that scripture again again it's uh second timothy second of timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and the scripture reads all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so what we need well i should say what we read and learn in the bible is from god that's why we have a bible if we learn from the bible that we have grown in our life because of of god this means god speaks to us and god speaks to us through the revelation of what we get from the bible um so shouldn't we speak back and give thanks because if we have improved ourselves because of the bible then we are thankful for the benefit that we have received that being said shouldn't we give thanks to god who wrote the bible and when i say god wrote the bible that is his word now god uses people for the activities on earth for example prophets and teachers in the old testament are the ones that wrote the bible but the bible was written through the understanding and the wisdom and the knowledge and the insight that came directly from god and now i'm going to talk to you about the historical argument okay so in short the people and places in the bible show up in history now very often uh in the old testament examples were given and stories were given so that they could be remembered through time so that's how um the old testament was remembered in the new testament which refers to the, jesus and the beginning of christianity parables were used see jesus spoke in parables which is very similar to telling a story and that gave us a way of remembering what happened but in the old testament as i say we talk about certain things like noah's ark with noah's ark we have a story that gives us um, an understanding of what god is trying to teach us but the stories that are given are given in a way that the people thousands of years ago could write it give it understanding and it was presented in a way that it could be remembered and shared with other people there was a purpose of the stories in the old testament so that the the word of god could be spread and there's a purpose of the parables so that they could be remembered so that the word of god could be spread okay um so uh the the people and the places from the stories that i'm referring to in the bible show up in history when we read descriptions of times and events we often find these same things in extra biblical history and when i talk about extra biblical history that means history outside of what was written specifically for the bible so further when archaeologists dig and uncover ancient artifacts it often shows us that biblical events that were not previously discovered were in fact true we're using today's technology of archaeology to dig up the historical evidence of the bible okay so for example scientists have unearthed archaeological evidence of bible history that's what we're talking about theologians use archaeological evidence to validate what is written in the bible as being true i'm going to give you an example one of many examples and i believe it's probably the one that's most popular is peter's house in capernaum 
Okay, it's Peter's house in Capernaum. So Capernaum contains the remains of a church from the fifth century AD, which is octagonal in shape. In 1968, okay, 1968, archaeologists, I should say, discovered the remains of an earlier church underneath it. This had been built around what was originally a private house, which was apparently used by Christians as a meeting place during the second half of the first century. Today, a modern church exists suspended above the site with the excavation site visible through a glass floor. So this evidence is now protected. Peter Walker, who's a professor of Biblical Studies at Trinity School of, uh, for Ministry says, graffiti that referred to Jesus as Lord and Messiah provides strong evidence that the room was used as a place of Christian worship, almost certainly because it was believed to be the room used by Jesus, perhaps the home of Simon Peter. And this is recognized in Luke chapter four, verse 38. Given that the early tradition goes back to the first century, this is almost certainly the very place where Jesus stayed, the home of his chief apostle, Peter. Now I'm going to talk about number three, number three, the empirical argument. It's the testimony of God in my life. Now I have shared in the church that I attend, that's uh, the Resurrection Center. It's in Springfield, Massachusetts. If you want to know about that, the website is um, resurrectionspringfield.org. Again, that's resurrectionspringfield.org. Um, and in social media, you'll learn about it uh, by searching TRC413, TRC413. So that's the church that I attend. So you, some of you uh, in Europe may have heard me talk about the Christian church that I attend and that I'm a leader of, well, that's what it is. It's the Resurrection Center. It's in uh, the Northeast corner of the United States. The website is resurrectionspringfield.org. Um, and in a recent uh, conversation with the congregation, I spoke about a time when I used to drink a lot of alcohol and at the same time had a lot of sleeping pills. And it was God that came into my life that directed me from near suicide multiple times. There's a whole story that goes along with that that I'll share in another episode. But during uh, the saving of my life, God connected me to my wife, who's a strong walker in the faith of Christianity. Um, but that's another story for another time. So that's the empirical argument. The empirical argument are the testimonies that God has in our lives, okay? Um, let me tell you more about the empirical argument. What it is, is people can be in a condition that may not be desirable. And what they do is they follow the teachings in the Bible. When you open up the Bible, in short, if I were to oversimplify, it tells you what you should do and shouldn't do. When you apply the principles of the Bible in your life with the guiding of a leadership team at a church, then the result is an improvement in your life. That improvement is called a manifestation. That manifestation is the change from bad into good. Well, that change from bad into good originated from the Bible. As we had already established, what the Bible is, is God's word. So the Bible corrects people's lives and turn them into something better. That's the empirical argument that demonstrates that God exists because that change, that positive outcome is what God wants for us because God has called us to a higher level of understanding of him and of a higher level of performance in our lives. So that manifestation that I referred to a moment ago is the evidence, the empirical evidence that God exists. So now I'm going to go to number four, the logical argument that God exists. 
There is a single coherent theme throughout the book that the glory of God is paramount. If God were to write a book, let's imagine God were to write a book. He's got a pencil and paper. If God were to write a book, this is how he would write it. Now, if man were to write a book, this is not how he would write it. It has the, the ring of truth, uh, as uh, C.S. Lewis would say. Man would tend to diminish his defects and exaggerate his virtues. The Bible seems to do the opposite. And the reason why is the Bible refers to the correction. What man does through a sinful nature is it will hide the negative and increase the positive. By increasing the positive, that shadows the negative. Because the negative is shadowed, there's no improvement. So if man were to write a book, man would not be able to demonstrate the ability to make improvement. But with God writing a book, and God did write a book called the Bible, God writes the Bible in a way through either stories as you see in the Old Testament and other scriptures and parables in the New Testament as said by Jesus. This helps us improve ourselves. The Bible is a book of correction. And that is why many people misunderstand the Bible is because it is designed in a way not to hide our sinful nature. It is designed in a way not to hide our faults, but it is not to beat us up. It is not to put us down. The purpose is to develop a sense of improvement. The only way you can improve is you have to first recognize what needs to be improved. Because if you don't recognize what needs to be improved, then it is shadowed and put away and you have the falsehood that everything is okay. When you live a life of that falsehood, then you wonder why things are not improving or you wonder why there are problems. You wonder why there are struggles. To avoid those struggles or to get away from those struggles, you first have to identify what is wrong. The Bible teaches us that. It not only teaches us what, what is wrong, it also teaches us how to find out what is wrong. And then it guides us into the area of correction. This guidance into the area of correction is called repentance. When repentance evolves over time, and takes shape and form, that is called manifestation. Now you know what the word repentance is, and now you know what manifestation is. These are common words we learn about when we're studying the Bible. Okay, so that is the logical argument. With the manifestation resulting from a repentance, we see the improvement that God wants us to have. Remember, God has called us into a state of being. That state of being is more than what we are now. It is a higher dimension of maturity. When we're in that higher dimension of maturity, then we can avoid the struggles. We can avoid the temptations that have us fail. That's what maturity is. It is that manifestation. So that is the logical argument of God. Man and God partner together to achieve salvation. However, with the Bible, God does not compromise. God says what is right. God says what is wrong. Because with a compromise, there's a gray area. With a gray area, that causes confusion. God is not a God of confusion. So that's why there's no compromise. 
he maintains and demonstrates his righteousness while showing forth his love. God is a God of love. At the same time, God is a God of correction because God wants us to be in a state of manifestation of a positive outcome. So on the cross, God is both the just and the justifier. So let me read Romans chapter 3, verse 26. Again, that's Romans chapter 3, verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Let me talk a moment about faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is faith in God. Jesus is our advocate to God. So Jesus is the way to the light. The light is God. Okay. Faith is the acceptance that God is your Lord and Savior. If you accept God is your Lord and Savior, that means you accept the teachings of the Bible. If you accept the teachings of the Bible, then you are ready to go into a state of repentance. That state of repentance is a state of correction, going away from the bad, leaning towards what is good, and understanding the difference between good and bad based on the teachings of the Bible. As you go through this state of repentance, then you'll have that manifestation. That manifestation is the change from bad to good. When you are in good, then the bad is no longer harmful to you. That's how God protects us, because God protects us from bad. And he does that by delivering us. What does that mean when God delivers us from the bad? That means God shows us the way. How does God show us the way? He has us go through a state of repentance. That means your change of way of thinking. As we go through this journey, which is this state of repentance, then we eventually will see the manifestation. That means the positive outcome, the change. That manifestation, that's God. Okay, I'm going to read Romans chapter 3, verse 26 once again. And here it is. The scripture reads, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now I'm going to go to number five, the scientific argument. Okay. We're going to talk about the scientific argument that God exists. Okay. Do you remember when Apollo went to the moon? The Apollo was the name of the project that NASA had. NASA is the space agency from the United States, um, and it was called Apollo. Well, humans, Americans, went to the moon in July of the 20th of July in the year 1969. And there's the phrase, the eagle has landed. Um, well, in February 5th of 1971, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, he was the lunar module pilot. It's called the Antares. And when I say the lunar module pilot, he was the pilot of the spacecraft that actually landed on the moon. And that was on February 5, 1971. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Um, I know him. He's passed away. But I, I, I knew him, I should say. Um, he was on my radio show. Um, and I interviewed him about his experience. So uh, I, I actually spoke to a man who walked on the moon. And as of today, in the year 2020, as we broadcast this, there have only been 12 people that have walked on the moon. So I was very fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity to talk to a leading scientist um, who actually walked on the moon. His name is Dr. Edgar Mitchell. So, well, anyways, this, as, as my conversation goes, on his way back to the Earth during the Apollo 14 flight, he had uh, a powerful meditation experience. And he wrote about it in his book called The Way of the Explorer. 
So starting in 1998, um, I, as I mentioned before, I had been on a talk show, I, a show host. Uh, it was called Today's Author. I spoke to him about it. And Dr. Mitchell spoke about his spiritual experience returning from the moon to the earth. He got a sense of the creation of the universe and therefore an understanding uh, a much greater power than man. Imagine being in a spacecraft looking at the entire planet Earth, You're looking at the entire population of the Earth from afar and behind you is the moon and in front of you in a far great distance is the Earth with the creation of God in front of you and being able to look at all of it in a huge landscape view. So through the power of meditation, he was able to sense the power of God. He's a scientist, he's a scientist. So I've told this story before um, and I'm gonna share it with you now and we're also going to do a special programming in the year 2021. Before Apollo, there was Mercury. Mercury was designed to uh, perfect manned space flight. Okay, it was a different type of vehicle and it was just orbiting the Earth and it was to get us ready to have a uh, space flight to go to the moon and that was the Apollo. Well, before Mercury, we needed to know what was in space and that happened in 1951. At Harvard University, something called the hydrogen line was detected. I'm going to speak about the hydrogen line in layman's terms. What that is, it's the detection that hydrogen exists in space. And the way it uh, was detected was through a telescope, but not the telescope that you look through. It's a telescope that uses radio frequency. So it's a radio telescope and it is called a radiometer, okay? By knowing hydrogen was in space, we could create the pictures of galaxies you see on the internet. You know those pictures you see the galaxy and you see the swirls and you see all the stars and it's a picture of the galaxy? That is not a uh, photographic image. That is from a radio telescope. Well, it was my father, my own father, who raised me. Dr. Harold I. Ewan, also called Doc Ewan, created the Department of Radio Astronomy at Harvard University in 1951, and it was a result of his first discovery of hydrogen in space. It was during Easter weekend in March of 1951. So he told me he got to see the universe and he knows God created it. I remember as a little boy, um, I think it, I was, it was probably before kindergarten. I remember I was a little, little kid we were sitting, sitting in, in the hallway in uh, the Indian style and he was talking to me. Everyone else had gone to bed. I would have this father and son talk with him and, um, and, and he would tell me for what he saw in the universe and he was the first one to see it because he was able to detect it. He got a sense as a scientist, as a leading scientist in radio astronomy at Harvard University, he was able to get a sense of the awesomeness and the power of God. He saw that the universe that he was exploring using a radio telescope was not an accident. He saw that what was created was an intentional design. So that intentional design showed my father that God really does exist. And he's a leading scientist at Harvard University. And as a young boy sitting in the hallway, having a father and son talk, uh, talk he taught me that God exists from a scientific point of view. Then last one, the purpose argument. This is the purpose argument that demonstrates that God exists. And therefore, the reason why we should pray, because if God exists, we need to communicate with God. The purpose argument. Number one, it's a relationship with God. Number two, it's revealing our love of God, for God. 
Number three, it's our finding refuge in God. That means rec recognizing that God is for us and protects us. Number four, it's our reassurance of strength and power because we're not alone. Number five, number five, it's a way to realize the will of God. That means the purpose of God. Number six, it's a method of receiving peace because we know God is with us. <clears throat> number seven, it's rejo rejoicing in God for what he's done. We are in celebration of what God has done in our lives. Remember, we talked about manifestation. Number eight, it's to be ready to listen to God. See, if we are prepared with the understanding that God exists and we pray to him, that's our communication to God, then we must in turn listen to God. Number nine, it's a real worship with God. That's the reverence we have with God. It's the giving thanks and the hallelujah to God. Number 10, it's resting in Christ. It's resting in Christ, knowing that we have an advocate representing ourselves, giving, giving a forgiveness for what we have done so that we can be loved. Um, it's number 11, it's the right weapon against the enemy. Because with good, there's bad, and God is good, and God is our weapon against the enemy. Number 12, it's reporting your problems and cares with God. We need to vent. We need to share. We need to ask. That's what God wants to do. God is there for us. Number 13, it's God's way of rewarding us. What do I mean by rewarding us? God blesses us when we follow principles that are outlined in the Bible, we become blessed. We become blessed when we follow the teachings of the Bible and remove the bad and increase the good. We are blessed because of the benefit of the good. Uh, number 14, it's refreshment with God. We, we stay fed with the word of God. We stay consistent with the principles of God. Uh, number 15, it's claiming the resources of God. When we talk about the word of God, the word of God is what is written in the Bible. And what is written in the Bible is a promise. God has given us a promise. What is the promise? Those are the resources. Those are the benefits. And in all of this, number 16, it's reaching our maturity in Christ. Remember, we talked about the the state of repentance, which in turn creates a manifestation. That's what I mean by reaching our maturity in Christ. So let me read a scripture. And that scripture is a prayer, a very common prayer that uh, those in Christianity are quite familiar with. So let me share that with you now. And that is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15. And again, that's Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 9 through 15. And I'll share this prayer with you. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive your sins. Be mindful of that. So now we've talked about prayer. Let's talk about a simple way in, in, in your new walk with Christ. What is a simple way to pray? What do you say? Well, the simplest thing, and perhaps the most appropriate thing I should say, 
is just to say, God, I'm here. That's a prayer. God, I'm here. Speak to me, Lord. If you want more, there's also um, an ACTS, A-C-T-S, way of prayer. There's four things you can say to God as you develop your walk with Christ. A stands for acts of God. C is confess sins. T is thank Jesus. Uh, S is to seek his presence. Okay, acts, A-C-T-S. So you can start off by saying, uh, A, adore God. Lord, hallelujah, thank you for who you are, Lord, in my life. Um, C, confess sins. Lord, I need to improve. I need to get better. I need the dark places in my life to receive the light, your light, Lord. And the T, thank Jesus. Dear Lord, thank you for forgiving my sins and thank you for the salvation that you offer. And I accept you, Lord. And the S, seek his presence. Lord, I'm here. Speak to me, Lord. Okay? And that's simple. That's a simple one. So again, Acts, A-C-T-S. Adore God is A. Confess sins is C. T, thank Jesus. S, seek his presence. But quite simply, just say, just starting off, God, I am here. But after you speak to God, there's the other part. Wait for him to answer. That's how you seek his presence. You speak and then you wait and then listen. You don't speak and listen. You speak, wait, and listen. During that waiting time, that's meditation. And then God will speak to you. Remember, God has a perfect timing and a perfect will. Okay? So, let me tell you about a movie. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a movie. There's a storyline. Uh, this is about a movie called The War Room. But it's an interesting story that is related to my conversation with you today. So, in the storyline for the movie called uh, War Room, there's a movie called War Room. You can look it up. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Elizabeth, and she's a realtor, and she goes to work with an elderly Miss Clara uh, to sell her house. Miss Clara senses the stress Elizabeth is under and suggests that Elizabeth fight for their marriage by praying for Tony. Okay, Tony, uh, that's the husband. So Miss Clara shows Elizabeth a special closet she has dedicated to praying and, and calls it her war room. Because, as she puts it, in order to stand up and fight the enemy, you need to get on your knees and pray. Well, the war room re represents a specific place of prayer. It's not a place of idolatry. You're not praying to the room. You're not praying to a statue. But it's a place of privacy where you can seek God's presence. Everyone has their own place. Okay? So, the director of the movie, his name is Alex Kendrick. So, the director, Alex Kendrick, he says, We called it War Room because, like the military, we should seek God for the right strategy before going into combat. And by combat, I mean daily issues we face in our culture. Um, the Alex and Stephen Kendrick's brothers got their inspiration from prayer with Alex saying that he believes even the idea of a war room was given to them by God. It's a great movie. If you have a chance, it's called The War Room and it's from the Kendricks uh, brothers. So now what? So I dare you. Um, I dare you to pray, give it a shot, uh, and understand who your creator is. Okay. Um, my name is Ambassador Professor David K. Ewan. I welcome uh, our new viewing audience from the United States. I continue to welcome our existing audience from Asia, the Middle East, Europe, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and uh, also Latin America. Uh, we thank you for being part of the program. We thank you for your support. Um, this program is called Inspire. Uh, for our second season that we're broadcasting now, it is a free uh, web series 
um, you can catch our first series in our first season, I should say, in Europe, where we originally broadcasted in the year 2019. In the year 2020, we're broadcasting our global web series uh, with uh, the addition of the United States as part of our viewing audience. My name is David Ewan, Ambassador Professor to the Nations. I thank you for joining me.